Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're taking a look at this rare Rev War era German Hessian Jaeger flintlock rifle. This German Jaeger is visually similar to examples attributed as having been used by Hessians during the Revolutionary War. The Hessians consisted of approximately 30,000 German troops hired by the British to fight against the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War and a rifle such as this one could have possibly seen use with an elite group of Hessian soldiers skilled in the art of hunting. The rifle features seven groove rifling, an iron ramrod, dovetail mounted brass blade front sight, flip up V-notch rear sight, and brass fittings. The lock is completely unmarked. This rifle includes a later leather sling, tools, and extra flints in the patch box. To see a similar example, check out page 226 of George C. Newman's book, Battle Weapons of the American Revolution. I'm a big fan of German muzzleloaders, mainly the Jaeger rifles. I think many of us are out there that are into muzzleloaders. The Germans kind of started the race for accuracy when they developed the rifled barrel in the 1400s. Since that invention, muzzleloaders have changed dramatically. Even up until 2021 when we're recording this video here, that race for accuracy with a muzzle-loaded charge and projectile continues you know, 600 years later, which is pretty cool. Apart from the sword bayonet attachment point up here at the muzzle, this is a pretty standard issue German flintlock rifle that we see in the late 1700s. I think the most dramatic difference that we see in a, in a German Jaeger compared to the American long rifle is this very short barrel profile. We see very few American made guns with this barrel length at this period of time. It's much more similar to some of the early to mid uh, 1800s American rifles that we see coming out of the Lehman and Hawkins shops later down the road. But this is quintessential late 18th century German rifle. I'm gonna open up the wooden patch box here just to take a look at this inlet. Now inside here we have several flints and tools that were added later. They aren't necessarily original to the rest of the piece. But what I like to point out inside this patch box is you can see that nothing on the inside of this inlet has been finished. This is all what I would call raw wood in here that has just been stained by time. Uh, you can see the dramatic color difference between the exterior of the stock here, kind of where it is carried and worn, and that inside. This becomes a, a topic of conversation a lot for contemporary builders and contemporary kit builders uh, as well who may have not done a lot of research with some of these original pieces. But more often than not, we see the inlets on these original pieces left unfinished. Um, there may have been an application of oil early on, but um, compared to the exterior of the rifle, on many of these originals that we see, we don't see any finish in here. And I like that. I like that about these inlets. It's a utilitarian area for the rifle. It's not you know, ever seen. Um, so inside these, inside these inlets and things, we start to see a little bit of the craftsman um, where they're getting a little cheeky knowing that it's not being displayed at all. Now, um, you could argue that with the, there's a nice, snap there too. Wow. <laughs> um, you could argue that with kind of military production items like this, they weren't necessarily made as art pieces. Um, but I think it can be said that the builders of these rifles did take pride in their work um, in some form or another. I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with German trigger setups. Um, something of note on this piece though, we just have a single trigger. There's no set trigger here. Um, on this muzzleloader. As we noted in the description on this piece, we have a flip up rear blade sight. So we have our standard sight here and we have our flip up sight to get a little extra yardage and to account for a little extra distance when it comes to, uh, to sighting in our target here. There's no indication on this target the yardage that the flip up sight would be intended for. Um, so it's hard to say, especially with such a short barrel profile. I will say that the flip up rear sight is about as, you know, is about sized to a 200 or maybe 300 yard mark that we see on other muzzleloaders from the similar eras, um, really within about 50 years or so. Um, and that's not, um, that's just me. That's my experience there. I could be totally off on that. Now, I'm sure that's adjusted quite a bit here for the length of this barrel. Maybe this has only taken us out to 100 yards with this short barrel. It would be really neat to get this out and see though. 
while the sling itself was added later and appears to be a fairly period appropriate sling for this piece, we still have these sling studs here. It's just a neat addition that we don't see a whole lot with some of the American muzzleloaders that we talk about. Um, but it really, I think, completes the look for this short rifle. There's just something about this compact platform of the German Jaeger that's just very appealing and the sling adds a whole lot to it. When looking at this piece from the top, I kind of use the breech and the tang as a center point for these. A lot of times you'll see the breech and the tang lined up in the center of the stock going all the way back to the buttstock. So you have a center line going from the buttstock all the way out to the muzzle. This piece is actually offset a little bit to the left. So we have more wood, the stock is a little bit thicker on the lock side or the right hand side. And it looks like there's a little bit of cast off kind of running to that right hand side here. It's interesting, I don't know the significance of that, if it just made it more comfortable or if that's how the structure worked um, for these other pieces in production. Um, but I think it's you know important to note because a lot of times we see that running straight center all the way through. I'm gonna flip it over here now. You can see on this side, we have very two very large lock bolts here connected to this brass side plate. Very simple engraving on here. We just have three vertical lines kind of separating each of the sections of this side plate. Nothing super ornate that sometimes we're used to with these German rifles, but when we think about this being a, a possibly military use, um, visually it's very similar to English and then American military arms that we see. Very limited artistic decoration on these. But you could argue as well though that the overall shape and design of it is artistic in itself. Um, so that's where you kind of get into uh, a little bit of back and forth on how you feel about military versus more artistic arms. We're not going to dive too much into that. Um, for the record, I think that uh, a piece like this, even as simple as it is, is very artful in its own right. We can see a really deep swoop here on our cheek rest and our cheek weld. Very comfortable design, very nice design. And unlike some of the later guns that we see, uh, very clean carving all the way around here. Um, this stock has a lot of wear and tear on it though. Uh, and I, I say that in a good way. It's, uh, I think it adds to the historic significance of a muzzleloader like this one that has been used so much. It really helps you get the idea that this piece was carried through the woods on a hunt, you know, through maybe even military action that's been used and, and a little bit abused. Uh, overall though, it's a really well put together, really nice piece. There are no major structural defects that I can see on this piece. It's hard not to wanna <laughs> hit the shoulder, something like this. That's just cool. You know, uh, Jaegers are such a neat, neat muzzle loader. As much as I love your, you know, Pennsylvania and your Kentucky long rifles. There's something about a Jaeger that we just didn't, uh, we took a lot of their best attributes and applied them to the long rifle. But it was a while before we started to see the compactness of the Jaeger in American arms. Being so short here, we only have two ramrod pipes. One, the entry pipe here towards the wrist and the other out here towards the muzzle. Um, much like many military arms of the day, we have our metal ramrod here. Uh, much more durable, uh, a little bit louder, but goes along with the suspected military use of this piece. Some other key identifiers to note here, we have a really simple barrel tang, uh, very rectangular going back, I'd say about three quarters of the way uh, of the lock plate. And looking at the barrel uh, and sighting down the barrel, I'd say it's swamped ever so slightly. Our breech and muzzle ends are a bit wider than we see here at the center of the barrel, kind of giving us a little bit more balance on this piece. The rifling will note, uh, being on this 62 caliber, uh, we have very deep round bottom rifling grooves. And I think, as I said earlier, we have seven of those grooves, uh, but it's a neat pattern to see, and I, and I think a, a key identifier for a piece like this. Going along with our simple brass ramrod pipes, while the ramrod pipes have some wedding band filing in them, our butt plate and trigger guard are very simple in comparison. The butt plate itself has a little bit of, uh, of file work or, or maybe engraving work around the border. Um, but other than that, very simple, very plain. Our wood patch box is rather beat up here at the front. I'm not sure if this is 
um, the result of maybe a stuck patch box in the field and somebody thumping on it a little bit here out of the front. Uh, but the tail end of it has brass kind of lining up with our brass butt plate, which um, again is a, a design element that we see a lot here in the colonial American rifles of the time. Overall, this is a pretty simple German Jaeger. Um, it's not necessarily a high nobleman's hunting rifle by any means, but I think it's a fine example of a German military rifle from the late 1700s and something that could have possibly seen use here um, you know, under the guidance of the British hunting down some continental uh, soldiers or militia of the time. Kind of, it's not necessarily a, a Brown Bess or a Charleville musket that can, could have seen use on the American side, but it still has some neat historic significance, I think, for us here in the States. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for inviting me out to take a look at this great muzzleloader. If you'd like to see more pictures of this and other exquisite muzzleloaders, Coming up here soon, visit the Rock Island Auction Company on social media. They're posting a ton of great pictures of rifles like this and more uh, for you to check out for free. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.